Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Raimundo, and this is Alex Carlucci. Good morning. We are members of the local group of Simulex and of the organized committee of this meeting. It's a pleasure for us to welcome you all and celebrate and declare open the ceremony of the 17th edition of the International Workshop on Real and Complex Simulators. I should say that today we also have two local authorities that we welcome you. Professor André Pons, the head of the ICMC Institute, and uh, Professor Regilene de Lazari, represent the leadership of the local singularity group. They will be invited to say a welcome word for you all. Let me now say some few words about this meeting. The International Workshop on Real and Complex Singularities is a regular BNL meeting organized by the local singularity group since 1990. And it became the key meeting for people working in singularity theory or singularist bifurcation theory and related areas to meet together. The sequence of uh, regular meetings have provided the appropriate atmosphere for world experts and young researchers to exchange ideas and together be able to create new lines and trends of research in singularity theory. Let me also say that uh, for the 70th edition, we have uh, at least two special reasons to celebrate. One reason, but not the main one, is that this is our first in-person meeting after the COVID-19 pandemic that started in 2019-2020 in Brazil. However, the main reason that make this edition very special for all of us. It is because in the 17th edition of the International Workshop on Real and Complex Singularities, we all together will have the big pleasure to celebrate the 60th birthday of the great friend, collaborator, and why not to say the more Brazilian of the Japanese mathematician, Professor Osamu Saik. Thanks for coming, Professor Sayek. And I'll take the opportunity to say that uh, we are very special for all of us here in São Carlos. Now, let me come back to the introduction, welcome and acknowledging part. So uh, let me invite now the organizing committee to come here. And uh, I would ask to, to each, of, uh, each of them Please to say the name to institution and a welcome to you all. Please come here to organizing committee, please. Okay, uh, let's start. Hi, uh, my name is Otoniel. I'm from uh, University of Paraíba. João Carlos Ferreira Costa. I'm from UNESP, São José do Rio Preto, São Paulo. Edson Sampaio. I'm from Federal University of Ceará, Fortaleza. Hello, I'm Alex. I'm from Federal University of São Carlos. Hello, I'm Leandro. I'm from UFSCA, São Carlos. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. I should also say that uh, uh, there is there are still three more organizers that could not come. The name is uh, Kentaro Saji from Japan, uh, Noriyuki Hamada, who is uh, currently in a uh, USA University, and Ying Chen from China, okay? 
And um, now I would like to uh, to invite the uh, student support team to come here, please. So uh, I would ask, please, uh, for each of you to introduce yourself and say the current position, okay? Okay. I am a PGG student here in ICMC. My name is Rafael. Good morning. I am João Vitor. I am a PhD student here at ICMC. I'm Amanda, and I'm a master's student. I'm, I am Igor. I am a PhD student here in ICMC. Uh, I'm also a PhD student. My name is João Paulo. I'm Ellen, I'm a postdoc student. I'm Anna Livia, and I'm also a postdoc student. Good morning, I am Giovanni, uh, I am a PhD student. I'm Beatriz, I'm in IEMC, I'm PhD student. I am Barbara, and I will be a postdoc student. I'm Igor, and I'm a PhD student here at SMC. Okay, um, they are available to help uh, all of you and whether you should, including for, to form groups to go to, for lunch or a coffee inside the outside uh, the campus, okay? And okay, let's thank Danny. Okay, uh, now uh, some few important uh, informs and announcement. Uh, for the sake of uh, safety, it's uh, mandatory to wear facial mask the whole time when you were inside any building of the CMC Institute, including this auditorium, okay? Also inside uh, the auditorium, it is not allowed to take food, cough, nor water. Sorry about that. But if you wanted to take water or coffee, but not food, but not food, it is possible to do that on next uh, room, okay, inside the auditorium. And uh, uh, so all talks in person or online will take place here in this building, this auditorium, and also in the building five. It is right here on my, on my right. Uh, I mean, if you just uh, get out of this building, the building five will be in front of you, okay? It's very easy to reach there. And uh, so to, to, to be able to get in the building five, you need uh, to use uh, your badge card, okay? It, it, it is with you. Once you have a resistor, you get it. You got it, okay? Um, and to access the library of the ICMC, it's free. Uh, you don't need the badge, okay? Uh, the library building is easy to reach. If you go outside and turn on left, you see the building right in front of you, okay? Um, well, what else? Uh, of course, uh, to, uh, to be able to run a meeting like that, we need the support and help of uh, the several teams here at the CMC. And uh, one of them is the event section, which uh, uh, is, uh, you know, the Marilia the, is one of the members of the event session, Renaldo, and also uh, uh, Fernan Fernando Mazzoc, okay? Also, we, we uh, were able to come to the help uh, with the IT uh, staff, Paulinho, and also Leonardo, okay? And, uh, yeah.
Okay, thanks. Uh, now, uh, let me invite our main host today, Professor André Pons, the head of the ICMC, to welcome you all. Good morning. In the name of ICMC, I'm very pleased to welcome you all for the 17th International Workshop on Real and Complex Singularities. In the last weeks, many of you have been here in the Simple Research School, Singularities and Applications, and I can see some familiar face in the audience. I congratulate Professor Raimundo Nonato, Araújo Santos, and the ICMC Singularity Research Group for this very important initiative. It's also important to mention that the Singularity Research Group was founded by Professor Gilbert Lobo in the 1960s, even before you had the ICMC. Um, the Singularity Research Group and the Mathematics Department make us all at ICMC USP very proud of its achievements. We place ICMC USP as one of the most productive and innovative mathematics group in Brazil. I wish you all a very fruitful workshop and a pleasant stay in São Carlos. Thank you. Uh, now let me invite Ale Alex Carlucci to say some words before for all of you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to me to be part of this huge event I appreciate the invitation from Cidinha, Regilene, and Raimundo to be part of the organizing committee. Uh, I was a student here, master, PhD, and a postdoc fellow. And now I'm, I have a current position at UFSCar. So I'm a son of this singularity group in São Carlos. It's, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm going to say some, some, some informs about uh, the organization of the workshop. The admission fee for the Wednesday uh, lunch is 80 reais. You have to decide this today uh, by midday. So I have some, we have some, some photos about, uh, of the campsite. So I suggest that you, you admit this to go and to have some, some fun. Uh, food and drink, music is included in this, in this fee, okay? Uh, there will be transportation to go and to, to get back to ICMC. So it is very easy to go. Uh, when we will give some instructions about this tra transportation before, uh, before we go. Uh, we don't have uh, coffee breaks in this edition of the event due to COVID restrictions. But at the end of the day, we are going to, to give you a, a kit with some snacks, a fruit and juice, so you can take home and eat, please, outside of the campus, okay? Uh, well, all the lectures here in the auditorium and the parallel session will be recorded and they will be available at the Singularity Group in São Carlos channel on YouTube. Uh, so if you have, if you need, if you want to make some questions to the lecturer, please raise your hand and ask and wait for the microphone. Okay, so your voice uh, will appear in the, in the record. The official photo will be taken on Wednesday, after all the lectures. Here, Reinaldo, is it better? Here in the... Okay, it will be here inside the auditorium, okay? On Wednesday, after all the lectures, around uh, 12 p.m. Okay, uh, the ones who will receive the local expense, ex expenses grant, pay attention to your inbox, because we are going to, to start sending the emails 
uh, asking you to go to the financial sector here to receive the money, okay? So pay attention from this afternoon uh, to your inbox. Uh, if you don't know where uh, is the place to receive your money, we have the support team, uh, the student support team that can lead you to, the, to this section here. Well, I, re I regard that the water and coffee is free. You can take it in the hall of the, the auditorium. But uh, whenever you are not drinking uh, water or coffee, please wear your mask, okay? Uh, I think we have some time here. We can show here the program. Uh, it's colored, okay? In light blue, we have the plenary talks, which will take place here at the uh, auditorium. And the yellow, the light yellow, will be... Uh, take, uh, will take place in block block five, just here in front of the the entrance of the auditorium. Okay, so the rooms are separated like A, B, C, and in front of the the names of the lectures, you have this this subtitle. Okay, mm, I think it's okay. Yes, okay. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce here Professor Regilene Oliveira. Uh, representing the leadership of the Singularity Group in São Carlos to say some words and to start the, the works of today. Thank you. Good morning. It is with an amazing pleasure that I, on behalf of the Singularity Group from São Carlos, welcome you to the 17th Workshop on Singularities, uh, edition to 2022, at the Institute of Mathematics and Computer Science from University of São Paulo. This is an important opportunity to bring together renowned younger uh, research in singularities, encouraging new collaborations and strengthening the ones in progress. Our group wish you an excellent and productive event. Please do not hesitate in contact us if you need some help. Thank you for to, uh, to be here. We have some minutes. Let's, let's, let's wait. Yeah. So we have uh, four minutes to start, okay? We, wait some minutes to, to start the first talk.
Cara, vem, ó. Seguiram o presente fulano de tal, 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 tal. Ligou, desligou. Só pra saber o que faz. É melhor. A gente padroniza. Mas depois a gente, as perguntas a gente pode fazer de baixo, certo? Sim, sim, sim. Só levar o microfone lá pro, pro perguntador. Né? É, vamos começar já. É, o pessoal, eu instruí eles a ficarem aqui na tribuna, o chair, tá bom? Tá desligado, né? Como tá ligado? Tá ligado. Vermelhinho ligado. Ok? Now we are ready to start our meeting. We start this meeting with a plenary talk. It's an honor to me introduce the first speaker in this 17th edition of the workshop on singularities. The first speaker is Professor Alexandre Fernandes from Universidade Federal do Ceará in Brazil. Professor Fernandes, together with Professor Lever B. Breyer, built a solid research group on singularity theory in Ceará, Brazil. Counting today with the participation of several younger researchers and students. His main area of interest is Lipschitz geometry of singularities. Today, Professor Fernandes will be speak about on the Fukui Kurdiga Panescu conjecture. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction, Regilene. So, welcome everybody. And uh, let me start with many thanks to the organizing committee to to do this this meeting, to do a huge efforts to, to do this meeting as much as possible in a presential way. I, I really missed that this mass atmosphere that is, is unique in São Carlos. I'm very glad to be here and many thanks for the organizing committee. Also, I'd like to, to thank the, the organizers to give me this opportunity to give this talk here in celebration of the sixth birthday of Professor Osamu Sayek is a great mathematician. So it's my pleasure and my honor to do that. Happy birthday, Professor. So, today I'm talk about Fukui, Kurdika, Panescu conjecture. Let me say just FKP, FKP conjecture. Okay. Actually, this is a joint work with Professor Edson Sampaio, who is here with us. Sampaio, 
and this big nev gelonic that I'm sure is following us in, uh, by YouTube, at least. Okay. And before to say what is the exactly the the this conjecture, I need to say some words about multiplicity. This is a kind of problem in multiplicity of singular points. So, which is, what is multiplicity? You have uh, an analytic subset of Kn. Let me put K here to mean real or complex field. Okay, and we are going to define the multiplicity at, even for your analytic sets. And what happens in the complex case? In the complex case, uh, let me put the point where we are defining the multiplicity, the, the origin. It makes simpler. So how can we see the, the multiplicity? So, if you take a linear projection from Cn, n is the, the dimension of the ambient space to Cd, d is the dimension of x near, near the point, the dimension of the germ. Take a linear projection such that this projection is a generic in that sense. We don't have tangent vectors to x at zero, which is in the kernel of the projection. This intersection is just the new vector. So if you are in this setting, then exist neighborhoods of the ambient space and also the linear space, which is the target of this, this projection. And uh, analytic subset, it is a kind of ramification locus of the projection. And co-dimension at least one set that When you take the restriction of the projection to x intersection to this neighborhood and remove this ramification locus, we have a covering, a finite map. Is a finite mapping. Uh, with topological degree m. I mean, this is a, a kind of picture of that, FCN <coughs> minus D, and here you have CN, CD, the ambient space has CN, and your set lives here. This is the singular point. Then what is required is the, there is no, uh, tangent vector here, which is vertical. You have to avoid that. Once you avoid that, uh, you are able to, to find a neighborhood of the ambient space, such that when you remove a ramification locus here, outside this ramification locus, we have a covering of degree M, in the sense that for any point, any generic point here, when you take the, the affine subspace defined by this point with respect to this, this map, the intersection of X as a set with M points, M is here. And, and the more important than that is this M does not depend on the generic projection. 
this is the definition of multiplicity we are work with, okay? In the complex case. So, in the real case, in the real case, um, take the ideal. Of course, this ideal is in the local ring. This is the ring of the analytic complex function at zero. This is complex, okay. Generated by all the real, the complexification of real analytic functions, function germs that vanish on the real germ. Here, in this case, X is an analytic subset of Rn. Then you have the idea of analytic function germs that vanish here. And you take the complexification of all of them and take the the idea here generated by these functions. Okay. Then we define a complexification of X. This guy is the zero set of this idea. This is the complexification of the real analytic set. Then we define uh, multiplicity of X in this case by multiplicity of this complex. Okay. So the Foucault and Kurdika Panesco is a conjecture about the real multiplicity. Of course, any, any conjecture about multiplicity comes from the Zadis question. The Zadis question is the famous Zadis question. By the way, let me do a, a advertisement. Uh, today afternoon, you have a, a talk by Thomas Pelke with an uh, important contribution to the Zadisk question. Okay. Zadisk question? It is what was stated in the 70s. Say, is multiplicity of complex hypersurface analytic sets a topological invariant of course uh, if you are in, in higher core dimension this question does not make sense in higher core dimension everyone <laughs> uh, any two guys are topological equivalent if you have a more core dimension and also, if you are in the real setting, this concept that that's not, that, that does not make sense. We have a lot of, at least, for instance, cusp and line. They are topological equivalent, but but the multiplicity are, are different, of course. This multiplicity here is two, and this multiplicity is one. So, if you want to put this this kind of question in a more general setting, maybe you have to, to ask something like that. What is, what is the geometric nature of multiplicity? So, in a vague way, okay? Then, considering such a question, now you have a conjecture, the F FKP conjecture, that say, and we are in the real case, 
FKP. This comes from 2004. It's exactly that. Let F from Rn to Rn be a subanalytic arc analytic and by Lipschitz homeomorphism arc analytic means when you compose your map with a uh, analytic arc then the the composition is also analytic so such a map has this property, uh, this property, this property by assumption. Huh? Then, if X and I are two irreducible, analytic germs at the origin such that f of x equals to y, then the multiplicity of x zero is equal to the multiplicity of y at zero mod two. This is the FKP conjecture. This conjecture is in a paper in 2004. So, let me say some words about the history of some contribution to this, this conjecture. One, Jean-Jacques Hissler, in 2001, proved this conjecture in the one-dimensional case. I mean, for curves. And X and Y are curves, one dimensional case. Okay. Uh, 2004, uh, FKP, in the same paper, they proved the same, the same result, 2004, one dimensional case, but they conclude that with this assumption, the conclusion is the multiplicity of x is exactly equal to the multiplicity of y. Not only mod 2. Okay? If conclusion. This is the one dimensional case. And In our paper with Jalonek and Sampaio, and Sampaio, you, you bring, we bring a, an example uh, that shows that there is no hope to, to conclude the multiplicity of x is equal to multiplicity of y if you are in higher dimension. The example is take x equal to x, y, z in R3, set that z times x square equal to y3. Then in this case, the multiplicity of x at zero is equal to three, and take y equal to y R3, set that x Sorry, z x4 plus y4 equal to y5. In this case, multiplicity of y is equal to 5 here, 3. And it's easy to, to, to have a, a, a map from C3 to C3, which is subanalytic. Uh, 
by Lipschitz and Arc Analytics and sends X to Y. You, in order to do that, you, you have to write X is a kind of graph of map. And this is the example in our paper. Then the multiplicity are different. And this set satisfy all the hypotheses in the conjecture. So, in 2010, Guillaume Vallet proved FKP for one co-dimensional case, co-dimensional case, and also for the two-dimensional case. I mean, when, suppose X and Y are hypersurface in Rn, sets of dimension N minus one, and in this case, Guillaume Vallet give a proof of the FKP conjecture. And also in the case where we are not necessarily called dimension one, but the set are surface. And in this paper, Guillaume Vallet brought a new element to this, this discussion was called the odd part of the tangent code. Okay. It was introduced in the paper of Guillaume Vallette. So what Guillaume Vallette did actually does not work if you are in, in the case different from this, this, this one. In this case, Guillaume Vallette used this, this guy separates the, the sphere in Rn then this is important, the dimension of this guy is one dimension less than dimension of the ambient to separate sets. So, in a paper with Jalonik and Sampaio, we, we prove this conjecture for any case, then you use this guy and another idea to, to arrive in the proof, okay? So let me let me say what's the idea we used to add to this element and arrive in the proof of the FKP conjecture. Proposition one. Let X and Y be algebraic. Oh, sorry, analytic uh, germs in CM and CN, respectively. If exists uh, by Lipschitz map, by Lipschitz. such that the graph of this map is also analytic, then the multiplicity of this complex set is equal to the multiplicity of the other one. So the proof of this proposition is, uh, is a naive argument that is quite important to, to complement the, the idea of to use the odd parts of the tangent cone. Let me give an idea how to prove this guy. So, we have a Bilipschitz map. This Bilipschitz is not necessarily defined in the ambient space where X and Y are defined, okay? Then the image of Y lives here in C. Cn, 
my set X lives here in CM. Why he lives here? And the graph, the graph lives in C M plus N. And take this decomposition of C N plus N, and take this pro this projection. X Y project to X. Okay. This is not a, a generic project for, projection for this guy because the dimension of the target is not the same dimension of gamma. Okay. In order to compute multiplicity, you have to project in, in the uh, sub, uh, linear subspace with the same dimension of the set. The dimension of this guy is the dimension of X. But this projection here has the property that we don't have tangent of x to the, to the graph, which is vertical, because my map is lip sheets. Then the graph cannot be like that. Once it is lip sheets, this implies that the, the kernel of pi intersection to the tangent cone of gamma is equal to the new vector. There is no vector vertical which is tangent to the graph. This is the Lipschitz property. So the graph is, is inside of a cone here. Then we avoid this kind of behavior. So when you take a linear projection of CM to CD, to compute the multiplicity of x, this guy is generic in the sense that the kernel of the P1 does not intersect the, the tangent cone of x, then this composition is generic for gamma. And you can compute the multiplicity of gamma using this composition. But once this guy is a bijection from gamma to x, the number of elements in P1 with V intersection to gamma is the same of the number of elements in P1 minus 1 C intersect to x because P, the restriction of P to gamma is a bijection between gamma and x. So this is the multiplicity of gamma, and this is the multiplicity of x. Then you conclude that the multiplicity of x is equal to the multiplicity of gamma at zero. So once you have the, this graph, is also a graph of the h minus 1, you do the same argument, and you arrive. This guy is the multiplicity of y. So this, is, so this naive idea with the old part of the tangent cone give us the proof of this conjecture, and I'm going to show how to do that. Oh. Yeah. What, what is difficult to choose this idea to solve the FKP conjecture is, in our case, our map does not have this property. The graph of our map is not an analytic set, and you don't have the, the notion of multiplicity of the graph in order to, to control this number of points in the pre image of a generic projection. Then you have to, to change a bit the actors in order to mimic this idea. So here we introduce the, the old part of 
So I need the spherical blow up. The spherical blow up as a map. Oh. that transform a point in a sphere. This map is defined by T, and X goes to T times X. Then once you have a, a set uh, with a single line at the origin, When you take the pre-image of this guy, the, the image of the origin goes to, to that, and the pre-image of this guy appears outside the ball. And when you take the closure of the pre-image of this guy, remove the origin, appears a set here, which is the link of the tangent cone of exit at the origin. So let me say, who is this guy? This is the x minus origin closure. And this guy is x intersection to the sphere times 0. That in, you can also write this guy here as the link of the tangent cone, the section of this sphere. This guy is the link of the tangent cone. Okay. So, and uh, we can distinguish some points here, in the, which are some directions, where your set has a, I've talked about that in the, the mini course, a kind of pamphlet structure. Okay. Let me distinguish directions, which are point here, correspond to tangent direction in dark stars. This point is called simple if exists neighborhood, uh, and neighborhood of this direction yeah. said that x prime intersection with this neighborhood when you remove the, the boundary this is a topological manifold with finite finite components. And when you add, when you take a component of that and you add the boundary, this is a topological manifold with boundary. And if A is a component of then A union with the boundary intersection with this neighborhood is a topological manifold with boundary. Boundary. So, then you have a, a, a function with kx defining the set of simple points. Once you have a simple point here, you can compute how many components you have in this this, pen, this pamphlet, how many pages you have in this pamphlet. So, this well defined on the simple points. We, we have a theorem that say that once your tangent cone is, has maximal dimension, then this set of simple points are open and dense 
the tangent cone, and we define the old part of the tangent cone. You take all the directions, set that the number of pages here is odd. And you take all the directions, simple, set that this guy is odd. And take the closure of that. This is the link of the tangent, the odd part of the tangent cone, and the tangent, the odd part of the tangent cone is, is the cone, the cone of this guy. Then let me list some properties of this the old part of the tangent cone. One. Property one. If x, y, sorry, h is subanalytic and by Lipschitz, also we have a derivative of this map. The derivative is defined. The domain of this the derivative of this guy is the tangent cone of x. And let me denote the derivative by this. Then the derivative uh, sends the old parts of the tangent cone of x onto the old part of it. Okay. The idea of this is once this map this mapping downstairs is by lifting subanalytic. You can lift, you can lift this map to the blow up spherical. And this map can extend continuously to the strict transform. And then this this extension send simple point to the simple point. And once this map, this extension is homomorphism. The name, the name of page in the pamphlet structure is preserved. So this is easy. So we have another proposition. So this property here is uh, an important step in our proof. Let me, let me take it here. Exactly, exactly the statement of this, another property of the odd part of the tangent cone. Let X be uh, D dimensional germ of an analytic set Rn. <clears throat> if this projection, you take a, a projection from the ambient space to Rd, where D is the dimension of the set, the real dimension is generic. So here, generic means when you, you take the, the complexification of this linear map, this complexification is generic with respect to the complexification of X. Okay, this is what I mean by generic. Uh, then for Generic V 
in the target, uh, the number of elements in this pre image intersection with the other part of the tangent cone is equal to the multiplicity of x mod 2. This proposition is, is very important to our proof. It's not difficult to prove this proposition, but it's, it's technical. How you avoid that here? Okay. And the last property of the odd part of the tangent cone is this odd part of the tangent cone is a kind of cycle. homological cycle. So, the Euler cycle. What is an Euler cycle? Euler cycle is a, a subanalytic closed subset in Rn or projective, okay. you can define both case such that such that for some stratification some stratification of the set you have your set here. Yeah? This is one strata. This is another one. This is another one. You consider the maximal dimensional stratus. The number of D minus one strata dimensional strata that contains a given d minus two dimensional stratum. I mean, here we have a d minus one, d minus two, d minus two strata, and you compute how many d minus one strata contains this guy in their closure. Closure is odd or oh, is even. Okay, then you have one, two, three, four, four is even. Then this is a kind of model of Euler cycle. It means that if the guy is compact, Euler cycle, if this definition implies this, it is. Uh, Z over to Z homological cycle. You take to all the stratas of dimension D minus one, this gives you a cycle with coefficients Z over to Z because of that. Okay. Then the last proposition is the old part of the tangent cone is proposition four. Is an Euler cycle. If X is analytic. And moreover, this guy is a full cone. I mean, we have two sides of the cone, not, not only one side of the cone. So we are ready to, to prove the, the conjecture.
Theorem. Jalonek, Sampaio, and myself, 2000, is the following. If uh, 8 from X and Y is a subanalytic, arc analytic by Lipschitz between two analytic subsets germs in Rm and Rn respective, then multiplicity of x at zero is equal to the multiplicity of y at zero mod two. So let me remark that we have proved a little bit more than the conjecture, the FKP conjecture. We don't suppose the map is defined in the ambient space. And also we don't suppose X and Y are irreducible. Okay, proof. Two minutes. <laughs> proof. Once this guy is belief sheets, and this guy sent the odd part of the tangent cone to the odd, odd part of the tangent cone of Y, then you may suppose they are both uh, not empty. Because when the tangent, the old part of the tangent cone is empty, is the tangent cone, cone is degenerated, then the multiplicity is equal to zero. Okay, degenerate. Then you may suppose the link of the tangent cone of this guy is not empty, and the link of the tangent cone of this guy is not empty. Then you have a map which is the derivative of eight defined here. Then we are in the, in, the, in, the, in the same situation of the proposition one. On the, we, I presented that naive idea here. Yeah. Rn, Rm, C prime, C prime, and here, the graph of C. Once C is a derivative of a map which is arc analytic, this map here is R homogeneous. That satisfies that. Because this guy is arc analytic. Then this guy is a full cone. And you use this property. Then this guy is a full cone. We have two sides here. And once this guy is an only cycle, and the graph is homomorphic to this guy, this guy is also an only cycle. Then when you take the the closure of this guy in the projective space, this is a compact only cycle. Then it has a topological degree with that. You take a generator of this homology here. The dimension of this guy is, is D, this homology. This guy is Z. Then you have a generator which is take a linear subspace of dimension N minus D. And this guy is a multiple of this fundamental class. And this number here uh, is a kind of multiplicity of this guy. Then when you take generic projection here and here to compute the multiplicity of this guy, this number comes equal to that. Then you use proposition three, which says is when you take generic projection of this guy and you compute the number of pre-image, this number is equal to multiplicity of x mod 2, then you prove the multiplicity of x 
is equal to m mod 2. And you do the same to x, uh, the odd part of y, because this guy is also a graph of that. So, and I finish here. Thank you, Alexandre. I don't know if you have, we have uh, questions from the YouTube channel, no? Okay, so now the, we have time to put some questions and comments for Alexandre. Yes, please, the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, professor, I was wondering, you earlier defined a, a map case of X, which gives the other part of the tangent cone is that a fixed map or is that a generic map given a set of properties? Like for example, maybe you are counting the number of uh, components of X that are trivially zero or... Sorry, Christian, uh, I don't understand the, exactly the, what is the question. So to define the, uh, the, the odd part of the tangent cone, it is given by the parity of a given map uh, K sub X. Yeah, and I was wondering if that case of X map is fixed, or if this is uh, an arbitrary map. This is uh, actually this, this map is, is is kind of density. It is it is well known as as defined by Kud and Habi. They compute the 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 number of sheets accumulating in one direction. You can. We can change a bit this this computation, but not too much. It's a kind of canonical. Thank you very much. Yes, please. So you gave a counter example showing that if you have simply two sets and you can't get the multiplicity of one necessarily is the same as the multiplicity of another with the under the hypotheses that you have in your theorem. Yeah. Um, can you take your counterexample and embed it in a family, which is by Lipschitz trivial, where each of the trivializations yeah. is arc analytic and uh, has a sub-analytic graph and still have the multiplicity change in the family? I have not thought about that. Okay. I didn't try it yet. So my answer now is I don't know. Okay. Thank but you. That's a good question. More questions, comments? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.
Now I'm unmuting myself. Can you hear me? Okay. Is it too loud? There's a fan in the background. Is the fan too loud for you guys? Okay. Let me see if I hear anything from the audience. Yeah, I don't think I hear anything from the stream yard. So I don't... Okay, it's off. Hello? Okay. Hey, um, so I don't hear anything back from StreamYard. So if there are questions and such, how am I going to know? Hi. Hi, Polo. Hi. OK. Yeah, I will do that. Uh, my question is, if there is some feedback from the audience, if there are questions, how am I going to know? Because I don't hear anything. I don't see any other videos other than mine. My speakers are fine, yeah. My speakers are fine. I mean, I don't hear much. Yeah, let me see. Audio... I mean, what? Yeah, so let me first share and then we can see. Um, I actually hear nothing from there. So let's see how to share it. Yeah, so I will do the share screen. Yeah, unfortunately, I can only do it through the tab and I will do that. Okay, do you see this one now? Okay, so I will put it in presentation form. Um, this is... Right. I I mean I do, but I don't hear anything from you guys, so it's like I'm gonna speak to a blank screen. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Okay. Um. So let me actually hang up the phone and see. You know, this is kind of silly, but if it comes to it, you can call me <laughs> through WhatsApp. So, yeah. Um, otherwise, I don't know if I'm seeing or hearing anything um, other than my presentation. Yeah. Okay, let me do that. Just give me a second. How about we do YouTube something? I'm going to turn this down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, this is just... <clears throat> okay. No, it's fine. See, I can I can hear things. I just cannot hear anything from the streamyard. Now, can you hear me? Oh yeah, now I do. <laughs> I'm it hang was up. my mistake. It was okay, my now mistake. I hear you. Call it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, this makes more sense. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we will, we will see and hear anyone during the presentation after for question time. It's going to be very easy, very, very good. Me travo. Acostumado com que esse micro, esse aqui, esse local, é esse aqui que faz a transmissão. E eu esqueci que eu estava usando esse, <laughs> que é esse cara aqui. Aconteceu alguma coisa com ele. Agora deu pau lá na... Ó, 
Ó, já tá perto de começar, né? Não, mas não tem ninguém aqui ainda. Né? 10h45. Uhum. Uhum. Manda um zap pra ele, Alex, por favor. Dizendo que a... Ah, ele saiu. Ele vai voltar. Hi, Lank. Uh, please share your presentation again. Oh. Okay, it's coming, good. coming. Perfect. I heard all your talked to Alex. You're okay. having some issues with your internet. I just heard it. I don't usually have it, but it, if it happens again, um, just give it a few minutes. I will find an alternate connection and get back on. So you may need to let me back in. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. You see the screen. It's perfect. You see the full screen, right? The whole slide? Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. So I'm, I'm ready to go whenever you guys want me to. Okay. We're having a chairman who will present you sure. in a few minutes, okay? Sure. The audience is coming to the auditorium right now. The audience is coming. They are coming from another room. So maybe in five minutes we start. And thank you for all, all your, your efforts to make it happen. Acho que ele não ouviu por causa de nada, que é isso?
Hi everyone, good morning. It's a pleasure to introduce Inanch Baikur, who is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Massachusetts. His main research interests cover low dimensional geometry and topology with a focus on his most four manifolds. He is going to talk about uh, four manifolds via singular vibrations. Uh, please, you can start where you want. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this very special conference. It's an honor to be here, even um, remotely. So let me see um, if there's any problem with the slides at any point, please let me know because I cannot view the screen and the slides at the same time. So I'll be talking about four manifolds um, by singular vibrations. This is a very general um, title, and that's my intention. Um, I intend to tell you mostly about the main problems in four-dimensional topology, um, how we try to approach them using several different methods, and how singularity, uh, singularity theory appears in these approaches. Um, so I won't be able to cover everything, but I'll be um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to cover at least some of the main directions uh, with some um, topological and geometric um, content. All right, so first I want to tell you about um, exotic manifolds and some special um, aspects of dimension four. So this will be also where I'll talk about the fundamental problem that I have in mind for all of this work. So let's say Z is some n-dimensional smooth manifold. Um, you can think of this as some standard manifold, a manifold that you understand very well. It could be the n-dimensional sphere or some complex plane. Um, so a space that you have a fairly good understanding of. Then when we take another n-dimensional manifold, X, we will call it exotic Z if X is homeomorphic to Z, but not diffeomorphic. So that will be my <clears throat> short, <clears throat> sorry, short annotation for um, C0 equivalence, but not C infinity equivalence. And that will give us an exotic copy of C. All right. So if N is different than four, if the dimension is different than four, one standard fact is there is no exotic Euclidean space. Whereas in dimension four, um, it might be mind-blowing, but after 40, 40 years, we kind of got used to this fact that there are infinitely many exotic R4s. This is due to several works, essentially Friedman and Dunson's work, um, followed by Gonf, Taubes, and others. So if n is less than 4, so let me make sure <clears throat> I don't lose my voice again, um, any um, two manifolds, if they're homeomorphic, then they're also diffeomorphic. So we don't have exotica in small dimensions. And if you look at higher dimensions, when n is greater than four, there are many examples that we know, and the most famous ones are the exotic spheres uh, in dimension seven and higher dimensions, um, going back to Milner's work in 1950s. An interesting fact though, this is due to Dennis Sullivan, is when Z is compact, there will be only, at most, finitely many exotic copies of Z. So if there are exotic copies, it will be still finitely many. So this is, again, radically different in dimension four. There are many examples that we have of compact Z with infinitely many exotic copies. And these, um, all these works rely on Friedman's and Donaldson's work, again, beginning of, of, uh, from beginning of 1980s. And therefore, we have this very standard, simple, fundamental question. Does every smooth four manifold, so I assume that my manifold is already smoothable, have exotic copies? And you can as well ask, does it always have infinitely many copies? So one particular case of this is very popular. It's known as the four-dimensional smooth Poincare conjecture, and it's still open. So if X is homeomorphic to the four sphere, is it necessarily diffeomorphic to it? And um, this problem is known in all the other dimensions. Like in smaller dimensions, there is no exotic copies. In higher dimensions, we know when we have um, exotic spheres. 
All right, so let me talk about two aspects of this problem, right? So we want to understand when Z and X are homeomorphic but not diffeomorphic. So the first thing is, of course, um, establishing that when X is homeomorphic to Z. So how do we tell this? So to keep the exposition simple, I will assume that we'll be looking at simply connected form manifolds. Again, all these adjectives, I don't want to repeat them. They will be smooth manifolds, simply connected. Um, I will take them with orientations and let's look at compact without boundary um, case. So here are some examples, again, of many standard manifolds that you know. These are all um, some standard examples of four manifolds. There's the four sphere. You can take the product of S2 with S2 again. You can take the complex projective plane. You can take the complex projective plane with the opposite orientation, the one that's not induced by the complex structure. And there is the famous K3 surface. Um, there are many K3 surfaces in algebraic geometry, but they um, they are all different to each other. So as a smooth manifold, I talk about the K3 surface. And it is the, um, it's given as this complete intersection that's, that you see in the slides in CP3. If you take a degree four polynomial like the one that I wrote there, then the solution set is the K3 surface. And you can take, again, K3 surface with the wrong orientation, or you can take connect sums of these uh, manifolds. These are all simply connected um, four manifolds satisfying all the adjectives I mentioned. Now, in the topological case, any such X, any simply connected, closed oriented smooth form manifold, it turns out is homeomorphic to a connect sum of the standard manifolds that I just mentioned. So it's a fairly short list. And taking their connect sums, you obtain the topological type of all simply connected uh, four manifolds. And this is essentially due to Friedman and the long work of um, uh, people working on the quadratic form, but um, the definite case being finalized by Donaldson in the beginning of 1980s. So you'll see that I mentioned here this modulo one conjecture. So in the spin case, what I said is not quite true, but it's believed to be true um, provided 11.8 um, conjecture is um, is correct. So it turns out that to, ter to determine the homeomorphism type of, um, of a four manifold X, you just need to understand that it's simply connected. So you can plug in Friedman's theorem. And then a few algebraic topological invariants will determine the quadratic form and the quadratic form will determine the homeomorphism type. And I just listed these. So one is the Euler characteristic that everyone knows. The other one is the signature, so the intersection form on the four manifold. Um, you can diagonalize it, and you can look at the dimension of the positive and negative eigenspaces, and their difference is a signature. And the intersection type is, again, when you look at this um, quadratic form, you can write it as a matrix. If all the diagonal entries are even, then this is going to be an even type manifold, otherwise it will be odd. So this, this means that the surfaces in your firm manifold, if you look at their self-intersection, if they're always giving an even self-intersection, that's an even manifold. Sometimes I would say spin manifold, otherwise odd or um, non-spin. So the topological four-dimensional Poincare conjecture, unlike the smooth case I just mentioned, is solved. So this is due to Friedman, and it's a corollary of this work that I just mentioned. If X is homotopic to four sphere, then it's homeomorphic to it. And again, there's a long history, and this is um, already known in um, lower dimensions, and dimension three being the long-standing one and, and resolved by Perelman. All right, so next I want to tell you about how we, how we compare the smooth type, right? The previous one was about the topological type. So to understand that we have an exotic copy, we actually want to tell that X is not different to Z, but I want to start with discussing how we sometimes tell that X is diffeomorphic to Z. And this is maybe the first occurrence of um, singularity theory in a form that everyone is familiar to. So here, what we do is we take Morse functions on X and Z. So there's handle body decompositions corresponding to them. We can um, create handle diagrams in low dimensions. This is very effective. These are essentially um, some link diagrams and more information um, on three dimensional handles. And then we do what we call Kirby calculus. And this is corresponding to surf theory for generic homotopies between these Morse functions. 
So here's an example. I mean, this is just to illustrate how it goes. It's a picture, so you don't need to really go through these steps. If you take S2 cross S2 and blow it one time, which, which means connect something with CP2 bar, the wrong orientation, and if you take CP2 and blow it two times, they become diffeomorphic. And this diagram that you see is actually proving it through what I call curvy calculus. Now, um, this, 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 this may be encouraging, so I want to um, push the brakes right away. There's actually no algorithm to tell if two given um, Morse functions, even if they are like the better Morse functions, they give us nice handle diagrams. There's no good algorithm to tell that um, through Kirby calculus, we can see them to be equivalent or not. So usually it's not feasible and it is not useful to tell that X is not diffeomorphic to Z. So instead we use smooth properties and smooth invariants, right? To, to argue that X is not diffeomorphic to Z, that's what I'm going to do. So let me give you a few examples. So the first example is, I will say X is irreducible if X is not diffeomorphic to connect some of X1 and X2 where neither X1 nor X2 is homeomorphic to the fourth sphere. So you will see that there is there, there's a category shift in this definition that's very common due to our um, lack of understanding of the smooth for Poincaré conjecture. So I am, for the semans, I'm just saying none of them is homeomorphic to the fourth sphere. So in this case, I will say that I have a smoothly reducible um, for manifold. So this is a smooth property, right? So because I look at it under diffeomorphism. Then admitting a complex structure, symplectic structure, Kähler structure, like Kähler metric, and other metrics, this is of course a smooth property. So if X has that property and Z doesn't, so I can, then I, then I argue that they are not diffeomorphic. And more importantly, we have several invariants going back to 1980s, starting with Dunstan invariants, then in 1990s with the revolution of Seiberg and Witten, we have easier to calculate invariants, which are way easier to calculate on some four manifolds, like symplectic manifolds, complex manifolds. And there is more contemporary um, Hegart floor invariants due to Ojat and Zabo. These are all invariants uh, um, that, 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 that are um, invariant under diffeomorphism, orientation preserving diffeomorphisms. That's why we call them smooth invariants. So how effective is Kirby calculus? Um, this is just to illustrate with two examples. You see, I, I gave here two diagrams, right? I'm on, on the passings. I want to mention um, some more complicated diagrams. So one is due to Bob Gonf, the other one is due to Salman Akbulut. And the first example is actually a diagram of the fourth sphere, which you know, it must handle the composition with a zero handle and a four handle, so it's an empty diagram. So this is equivalent to an empty diagram. And this is something Gonf um, proved after about 30 years, these um, potential counterexamples to the, um, um, to the four dimension Poincare conjecture were given. These were given as potential exotic four spheres and much later um, people were able to show and in this example show through these handle diagrams and Kirby calculus that it is equivalent to the standard four sphere. Now the second one is actually an exotic manifold. It's a exotic gradient surface, CP to one up twice um, in the topological um, class of CP to one up twice, homeomorphic but not diffeomorphic to it. And the diagram was given by Akpulut, but this was already known to be exotic. So the diagram itself is not giving us that information. It's kind of in retrospect, once we have the examples, you can try to draw those diagrams. So the takeaway from this um, is it may be useful to use Kirby calculus and going back to singularity theory, the theory that comes from Morse theory and Cerf theory um, to establish two manifolds are diffeomorphic or to establish that something's actually standard, not exotic, but it doesn't help to get um, exotic examples. All right, so I'm gonna tell you now about one geometric structure that will stand out in this, um, in this talk. It's a symplectic structure. And I, I will try to um, tell how it relates to the discussion we just had, right? What is the connection to exotic four manifolds? 
All right, so this is the general um, definition for um, any even dimension to n dimensional manifold X. If I have a close two form, here I called it omega, which is non-degenerate, but moreover, I'm assuming non-degenerate is equivalent to when you raise it to the top um, which with the self um, power, then you will get the volume form, but I want, I want that to give the right volume form, the one that's induced by the orientation. So it's compatible with the orientation on the four manifold. On the on the manifold, and it, this will come come in subtle ways. We will see that there is this um, the, the, this the, the, this aspect that when we look at symplectic manifolds, the um, the orientation of the manifold, um, the compatibility with it, the symplectic forms compatible with orientation will manifest itself in many different ways when we look at um, singularity theory. Right, the standard example, um, I and mean, I should give it, is again, let's go back to dimension four. When you take the flat coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2, is going to be the symplectic form that just I spelled out here. And due to Darbu, any symplectic form manifold locally has this symplectic structure. So the, the interesting structure on a symplectic manifold is always global, not local. So another example is you can take product of two surfaces. So genus G Riemann surface closed and genus H or uh, Riemann surface. And as I showed here, you can just look at the pullbacks of the volume forms. Volume forms are symplectic forms on surfaces. And if you sum them, this will give you a new symplectic form on the, um, on the product manifold. And in fact, in general, you can see this as like a trivial vibration, right? It's a product say sigma g vibration over sigma h. But in general, if you take a sigma g bound or sigma h, except for some very silly cases when g is one, this will be always symplectic. And this is essentially due to Thurston from 1976. Uh, also Kodaira, sorry, around the same time. Um, and any Kähler, sur Kähler surface is symplectic. The Kähler form itself um, is a symplectic structure. So in particular, some of the complex algebraic surfaces I mentioned in the um, slides that we have earlier, like the complex projective plane, S2 cross S2, or the K3 surface, they're all going to be um, um, Kähler and therefore symplectic. All right, so this is a diagram uh, to keep in mind in general. Um, it's not directly connected to our talk, but when, once I introduce these structures, I need you to know where they stand. So, Kähler surfaces are symplectic, and of course, symplectic manifolds are smooth by, um, by assumption. But these, um, these, these, these subsets are all proper. Like, for instance, you can take certain surface bounds or surfaces with odd first beta number, and you know that for Kähler ones, because of the Hodge theory, they should be even. So you can conclude that they are symplectic, but not Kähler. And some of the manifolds, like the force theory we just mentioned, is a smooth manifold, but it cannot be symplectic, right? The, the, the definition even tells you that for a symplectic manifold, I should have non-trivial second um, cohomology. So this fact that I'm mentioning, um, maybe the attribution is in the next slide. Um, I'm still too many people um, starting with Donaldson theory then with Cyberg Witten and um, Ojas Zebo invariance, this was established over and over. So if you have a closed symplectic for manifold, then one thing that you know is it doesn't decompose as a connected sum of two um, four manifolds, X1 and X2, where each one has positive B plus. So B plus is the positive eigenspace. In other words, you have some surface with positive self-intersection in X1 or X2. So this doesn't happen. So if you have a symplectic manifold, you cannot decompose it that way smoothly. So then if you look at these examples, this is a very crowded line, um, I realize. So if I take M copies of CP2 in a connect sum and then some copies of CP2 bar, once M is greater than one, when it's, it's, it's at least two, this does decompose as B plus positive uh, manifolds, right? As a connect sum of B plus positive manifolds, so it cannot be symplectic. And there are a few others that are listed here with K3s and S2 cross S2s. So these standard topological manifolds we mentioned, right? We take connect sums of these S2 cross S2s, CP2s, K3s. Uh, most of them don't admit symplectic structures. 
So therefore, if you happen to construct, obtain a symplectic manifold, and show that it's homeomorphic to one of these, then we will know that it's going to be exotic, right? In all these cases, it will be homeomorphic in the same topological type, but it won't be diffeomorphic because it, it misses a simplex structure where the standard ones, they don't. And we also know um, a lot about some other cases when um, B plus is one, like the creation surfaces, S2 plus S2, or the um, standard case for K2 where B plus is three, we know a lot about syntax structures on them. So there's a second part to this story. And here I want to tell you what we don't know. I mean, the first slide looked like symplectic form manifolds are great to work with because we can we know a lot about them, so we can uh, we can tell whole a lot. So one thing that one disclaimer that I want to start with is first. All closed exotic four manifolds discovered to date, in fact, go through symplectic constructions. So these are manifested in several people's works, like Gon, Fintusha, Stern, John Gil Park. I see them as pioneers of this. Um, so when you look at these works, you will see that first you get a symplectic manifold, four manifold, that's an exotic copy of some standard Z. And even the non symplectic examples are later derived from this symplectic one. And this is really relying on grand, um, very deep work of um, Cliff Taubes. Um, the fact that they admit simplex structures allow us to calculate the cyberac witten invariance, say Hegart flow invariance, and such very effectively. So what's important though is there's enough flexibility for performing surgery. So you know, for topologists, for men, if you if you are working with manifolds, it's one of the key things. You know, that's why my email is born with. Um, spam from surgery journals, medical surgery journals all the time. We like surgeries, right? We take out some manifold pieces, put them back in. So in the complex world, it's very difficult to do it. There are very um, few constructions that will work in your favor and usually because they they give you something global. But here you can localize and um, perform these constructions. So I gave some buzzwords. You don't need to know these. Fiber connect sums, so in just surgeries, relation blowdowns are some symplectic surgeries. But in the meantime, there is enough rigidity for the structure results like the ones I was attributing to tops to carry over throughout these constructions. Like you can use geomorphic curve techniques um, and the non-vanishing of these smooth invariants. So most standard simple connectors Z have been shown to have exotic copies. But what's open is still for the fourth sphere, as we discussed, we don't know it. So one curious case is definite case. So if you have connect sums of CP2s, then we don't know if there is an exotic copy of that or not. It doesn't matter how many connect um, summands you have. Same same applies to the case when you reverse the orientation. And another case that turns out to be very difficult is when the signature is zero. So if you take connect sum of sums of CP2, CP2 bar, right, the signature is one minus one, to get a zero. So if you take sums, the signature is still zero, or you take connect sum of S2 cross S2s, again, um, through the connect sum, the signature is additive, you take signature zero manifolds. When the number of summons were not large, um, the, 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 the existence of exotic copies were not known. And there is an interesting um, conjecture, and this is one of my favorite problems that I wanna drop here, you can also talk about symplectic four-dimension Poincaré conjecture, which says if X is homeomorphic to CP2 and is symplectic, then it's diffeomorphic to it. So this is this this, this is a great conjecture. Of course, you know my um, my curiosity is more about the existence of examples that will disprove this conjecture, some exotic CP2, and. It's fair to also mention that this is not known in higher dimensions. So this is not something that was better understood in higher dimensions because now there are geometric structures um, involved. But in the complex case, it's known. So if X is complex and homeomorphic to CP2, then the um, the celebrated solution of um, um, Yao of um, Calabi's conjecture shows that X will be diffeomorphic to CP2. Let me check. So we start at uh, 50, 25 minutes.
Okay, so I think I'm ready to tell you about the next occurrence of singularity theory. This is Lefschetz pencils and vibrations. In fact, in this talk, I will I'll discuss more the vibrations and pencils only um, in the passing. So this will give us a more uniform approach to building symplectic manifolds. Right, so, so far I told you about several different families of symplectic manifolds, but I will try to now illustrate how we can um, aspire to at least obtain all the symplectic four manifolds using um, the approach that I'm going to lay out. So um, this is the three areas that we all like, right? In pure mathematics, geometry, topology, and algebra. So the first object comes from geometry, right? So I have a symplectic structure on my four manifold. So the pair is a symplectic manifold, x omega. And then um, the work, so from, this is really going back to Lefschetz essentially, but um, in the Kähler case, but in the symplectic case, this is a more recent story um, going back to mid nineties. Donaldson shows that every symplectic manifold um, gives you a Lefschetz pencil through Blois Lefschetz vibration. And the works of um, Thurston and Gonf, Gonf generalizing in Thurston's work, tells you that if you have a Lefschetz vibration, I get a um, symplectic manifold. You will see that this is a weekly arrow because correspondence is not one-to-one -one in some meaningful way. And there are some ways to discuss it, um, which, which is really not essential for this talk. What's essential is to know what the Lefschetz vibration is. So I'm looking at a map from X. Um, it's on the bottom of the screen to CP1, to, to, to two sphere, where the critical set is just a discrete set. So I'm looking at compact manifolds, finite many points. So I will always assume that we have these critical points to um, rule out the trivial cases. Then I'm taking orientation preserving local models around this point X and its image F of X. So in the domain is R4, right? So I can think of it as C2. In the image is R2, so I can think of it as a C. So I can write this complex model, Z1, Z2 mapping to Z1 times Z2. So the way that um, this appears, some pencil is usually viewed as like a bouquet of surfaces at certain points. So I won't um, discuss the model around those points. They are called base points, but after blow ups, what we obtain, so passing to a blow up of the manifold is an actual vibration where the critical points, around the critical points, I only have these, um, these singular models. So you'll see that this is a dimensional reduced picture, of course. I drew the base and the fiber, they're like one dimensional. But the ones that are like self crossing are actually in um, two dimensional picture are giving us nodal singularities because you'll realize the complex model I just wrote down is, is for the double point singularity. So it amounts to having a certain, like at a regular um, fiber at, uh, over a regular value, I have a compact surface of certain genus. So when I come to a critical point, there's a certain uh, loop on it that will contract to a point. So I'll have this nodal singularity. I don't know if you see the um, cursor, um, so I will obtain it through this um, this contraction. And just to keep it simple, I will assume that um, every singular fiber has only one node. So I can I can look at local monodromy um, in a simpler way. Okay. So I'm hoping this is all synced up. Every time I go back to my screen, I see the shared screen is shaking. All right. So let me tell you the third part, the algebra part. So this is actually um, before Donaldson, um, due to Kass and Massimoto, and back in the 1980s, they tried to understand complex algebraic surfaces that were fibering, uh, that had sem semi-stable um, vibrations, giving Lefschetz vibrations. They tried to understand the local monodromy around it. And the basic idea is, if we go around one singular um, fiber, so in the image I'm going around one critical value, what I see is, a dam twist along the loop that I mentioned, the one that gets contracted, you will see a dam twist along that one. Okay. So if you look at all these guys, right? So I can go out around one, then a second one, then a third one. You can tell that I was ready to give this talk on my iPad, which didn't work on StreamYard. So I hope you can do this much um, imagination with me. So if you go through all of them, then the global loop 
is homotopic to the loop on the other side, which is trivial. So there is no critical values there, which means I'm looking at a product of Dan twist that I wrote as TC1, TC2, ta, 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 TCL. I'm using the convention where I take the product from right to left. It's globally equal to one. It's actually isotopic to one. So I take it in the mapping class group of the genus G surface, which I call mod sigma G. And this is obtained by taking orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, modular isotopies. Okay. So you can ignore the extra line because I'm not using boundaries there anymore. So this is what I will call a positive factorization. So a symplectic manifold, Lecce's vibration, positive factorization. These are three different occurrences of the um, of the same object. And we just talked about the um, Dan twist um, along these curves. Okay, so this is really the um, rich correspondence that I want to build um, some of the next um, slides on. And in fact, you may be inclined to do what most people um, try to do after Donaldson's work. And this is probably our first impulse because you know, algebraic topology is so useful, so helpful to distinguish um, topological objects. We usually associate algebraic objects, topological objects and study algebra to um, conclude things about them, right? Basically to differentiate them. So algebraic invariants are great. So you may be inclined to um, work this from left to right and associate some invariance to symplectic manifolds, which is still a good idea. Um, there is no um, um, concrete outcome of um, those efforts after even 25 years. But interesting, you can also explore this correspondence from right to left. You can start with the algebraic structures because these are some ordered tuples of curves, essentially, the Dan twists, like C1 through CL, and use a rigid algebraic structure to obtain a relation, then use the correspond due, due to gas cas and mass motor to build the handle body. There's a certain way to build the handle body along with the vibration on it. That's the middle, um, middle part in this chart and then use um, GONF to associate the simplex structure to it. So you can use this algebraic study to obtain in interesting simplex manifolds. So here are two examples, and then I will tell you, um, you know, some of the things that um, more recently we were able to accomplish using um, this this approach, this strategy I just outlined. So here are two examples. Um, it may be hard to parse the whole thing right away. So maybe the first one is easier. You see, I gave several copies just because I didn't want to crowd the figure. So you see, this is a genus two surface. Please, please forget the. Um, mark points for now, it's a genus two surface, and I have seven different curves on it. So they have names, and this gives me a product of seven Dan twists, and I claim that this is actually equal to one in the mapping class group of genus two surface. So this turns out to be the shortest um, um, non-trivial word um, that you can um, create with positive Dan twists. So right-handed is positive, left-handed would be negative. And this orientation compatibility I mentioned, remember we use locally orientation preserving charts, gives you always positive down to us. It turns out it's the smallest genus two surface, genus two lecious vibration. It's a, this is a positive factorization I discovered with my collaborator, uh, Mustafa Korkmaz. So the one you see on the right is more elaborate. This is a genus five surface. So the factorization takes place in, um, in, in genus five mapping class group. So here there's 26 vanishing cycles. So the, the labels are obvious, so you follow the order. And when you look at this product, again, I claim that this identity, discovering this is of course um, even more work. And this is um, from my work with, um, joined with Noriko Amada, um, who is also, um, um, he was a PhD student of Osamu Saiki that we are honoring today. And in this in this um, construction with Noriki, we came up with this beautiful example where you can see it communitarily an exotic creation surface. And there is more story to it. I'm not telling you about these base points. When we add the base points to the story, we can actually obtain more and more interesting um, examples. All right, so 
a few um, applications um, using this strategy that I um, try to outline and um, promote in this conference. And you can read these as success stories, which tells you that everything else is still open. You know, those are her stories of failure. Um, there's no point in discussing them at length at this point, but we learn a lot from those too. There are certain attempts that don't really give us any uh, fruits so far, but I will mention a few that did um, give some fruits. So the goal, this is a repetition, um, but apparently it's a very good um, way to pass any message. Um, just repeat it a few times. So we are trying to develop these techniques to generate positive factorizations, the algebraic side of the story, that will correspond to interesting um, inflective form manifolds through Lefschetz vibrations. Um, and through this, we will try to understand the topology of symplectic manifolds better. And because symplectic manifolds often give us, um, not often, but uh, more than often maybe, like generally other than some small cases for topology give us exotic um, for manifolds, it gives us a lot of insight about um, this fundamental problem I mentioned about 20 minutes ago. So here are some outcomes um, that I want to mention. So the first one um, is about six, seven years old now, is joint work with um, Jeremy Van Horn Morris. We discovered that contact tree manifolds um, can have arbitrary large stand feelings. So if you're familiar with these, um, then you know this is an interesting um, statement. If not, you know, I don't want to go through that story. It's a very story. Again, uses many of the objects I mentioned, but you can study contact tree manifolds through um, four manifolds, they bond where the contact structure is induced by the complex structure through some maximal distribution on the boundary. So if this is a Stein subdomain, it was conjectured that the topology could not be too large. But using exactly these techniques, using algebraic techniques, Jeremy and I were able to show that you can actually obtain arbitrary large Stein fillings. And in more recent years, um, several works, um, some of them are due to me, um, me and Mustafa Korkmaz, and with Noriko Amada, we obtained these very small, those are the hard ones, remember, um, exotic creation surfaces via Lefschetz vibrations and pencils. And um, more recently, um, and this is, this is going to be a 22 um, theorem um, as soon as I uh, finish writing my portion, otherwise Noriko already completed um, his part, is that we can also um, build very small signature zero um, um, four manifolds. Um, in fact, if you look at connect sums of like CP to CP to bars and S2 cross S2s for every old, even case is a, is a bit longer to describe, um, as long as M is at least nine and n is at least 11, we can obtain um, exotic copies of these um, standard four manifolds. So this very hard case, the signature zero case, is essentially mostly resolved um, through these constructions. All right, so let me move on to, I'm um, about at 40 minutes mark, so let me move on to further generalizations. And now I would like to tell you about singular vibrations for um, arbitrary smooth form manifolds, right? So remember the diagram I gave, I've been discussing it for symplectic manifolds for a while, but you know, they're not all four manifolds. So how do we really study all four manifolds? Like how do you want to approach the force field, let's say? So for that, um, the objects that I would like to discuss, which are generalizations of the ones that we discussed earlier, are the simplified broken Lefschetz vibrations. So let me go through the definition first. So I'm taking, again, a smooth map from the four manifold to the two sphere. Now the critical um, set is going to have two copies. There's a zero dimensional set, C, and there's a one dimensional set, Z. So C is just Lefschetz critical points. So it's what we had earlier. Z is indefinite fault points. So this is one dimensional. And these will be, will be the fault points that you know from um, singularity theory. So the local real model around the point 
in Z will be exactly the one that I just wrote down. There's a distinguished direction T, right? So R4, you can think of it as like R times R3. There's a T direction and R3 direction. The X1, X2, X3 coordinates in the image, this is again a copy of um, R2. There's the distinguished T direction and there's a quadratic form in X1, X2, X3, which has index two, right? There's two negatives uh, for this quadratic form. So the local model, um, I don't know how visible it is in big screen, large screen, I hope you can see it. In the base, if you look at the image to be embed, embedded for this um, fold, there's, there's a family of them, T parameters, right? So if you go across that blue guy, what you see is what happened with the nodal singularities in the complex model. Now I have a real model. Before, so I contract this loop. Right? Once I contract it, once I go across, you know, I, I separate along those. There's, there's, there's this kind of surgery that you do, but it's, per, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a parametrized surgery. It happens every time you go over that blue curve. So there's an S1 family of them. So this is what I call indefinite fold. Indefinite because the index is two. Of course, this is not very sensitive to orientation. It could be one, it's just the direction, but it's not zero or three. So a few extra things that I want, I really want them to be able to simplify the topology. Otherwise we can have a very complicated map. In fact, a huge mass. And this is usually what you get if you deal with arbitrary generic maps. I want F to be injective on the critical locus. Um, I want all the fibers to be connected. Like if you see that surgery, let's assume that that red curve was actually non-separating. And Z will be connected. So there's only one indefinite fault. Observe that empty set is connected by definition. So it could be a left vibration if Z was empty. And this last one will make more sense um, once I show you a schematic picture. The Lecce's singularities that we have, I'll assume all of them are on one side of this indefinite fold. Like in this picture that you are seeing, they'll be on the left. I'm hoping the next one is that one. Yes, this is a good picture. So in this picture, you see everything that you need to see. The, the equator, the blue curve is the image of the indefinite fold. On the right, you see the higher genus side, it's a genus three surface. On the left is genus two. And all the left shed's critical values are on the right. So the nodal singularities only appear on the right. And they also appear when you go across the um, indefinite fold. So for those of you who are familiar with it, you can see what happens in a neighborhood of that indefinite fold. It's an annulus. On one side, there is a genus two bundle over an S1. In one, on the other hand, there's, I have a genus three bundle over S1. So there is a cobordism in between. That's a round two handle cobordism. I'm attaching a two handle to every fiber. So S1 times two handle uh, attachment from right to left. So broken Lecce's vibrations without all these adjectives that I edit were um, introduced in the work of Oro Dunson and Kasarko, who were generalizing some of the ideas of Dunson from 90s, from symplectic to what's called near symplectic structures with some partial existence results. And the simplified ones were introduced in my thesis around 2007, again, with only partial existence results. So what is special about simple, simplified broken left shed vibrations? I think that's the next thing that I wanna talk about um, because I spent so much time discussing left shed vibrations that propaganda shouldn't go wasted. So I wanna tell you that extends over um, SPLFs. So first, they do induce simple handle decompositions just like Lefschetz vibrations. So here's an example of um, CP2 with the wrong orientation. So this is a genus one simplified broken Lefschetz vibration. On the right, you can see. So this side is genus one, on the left is genus zero, and there's only one nodal singularity, in fact. So for this nodal singularity, I have a two handle. It's this guy, it ended up being kind of twisted. Sorry. Um, no, it's this guy, right, it's minus one. This one is a longer story. But then the one, the blue one that says zero comes from the round two handle attachment. So that's, that's the first thing. Then the second one, again, you did expect this to come because I spent a lot of time advertising how we can use this algebraic structure coming from the mapping class group to study symplectic manifolds. 
We can do the same to study generally smooth form manifolds. But for that, you need a simplified broken ratio vibration. So for this, you need three elements. You need a product of the Antwes. So here, I guess I didn't care about index C1 through CL as usual. So this is what you have on the right-hand side, the product of them. Then some loop that goes back to itself that comes from the round two handle cobordism. And now the most like loaded one, condition three, this is a subgroup of the mapping class group. It's called the stabilizer group. All the mapping classes that stabilize C. So this product phi definitely leaves there. That's the only way I could have attached that round two handle. But when, once I go to lower lower side, I have trivial monodromy. So it means it should map to uh, one under this, this cutting homomorphism. I put it in quotation marks because in literature there are many different expressions for these. This is multiple steps. You cut along this curve and then you cap. And usually when you cap, you have the origin for the disk and you forget the disk. So this is how you go from genus three to genus two. And um, last but not least, these can be still supported by geometric structures and they're amenable to calculating smooth invariance. So this really goes back to works of Taub, Taubes who studied the same like, theory that he developed for symplectic manifolds for near symplectic ones. They're essentially corresponding to symplectic structures in the complement of these indefinite folds. And more recent, recently, um, Chris Kerrick was able to um, push that agenda further and works of um, Orodans and Casarco and Dance the student back then and Perus um, also um, uh, intended to describe invariance um, using um, these broken ratio vibrations. Now, one question that I left um, unanswered is the existence of simplified broken ratio vibrations. Right, so I introduced these to discuss all smooth form manifolds. So you do hope that, um, in fact, we will be able to see them all smooth form manifolds, therefore. So it is true, indeed, that every closed orient smooth X admits a broken Lecher's vibration. So this is um, now known by, for like 14 years. And this theorem, when I proved it, um, I was at Columbia, I was a postdoc there. So I used in this singularity theory to prove this theorem. But maybe more importantly, um, the way that um, this, this result really came to life was due to um, a conversation I had with Yasha Eliashberg, who told me about, um, when I described him, like the type of result that I was, um, I, I was after, who told me where I could possibly find such results. And in fact, the, um, the theorem that I just mentioned is essentially a corollary to a beautiful result by Osamu Saiki. And this is, um, again, I'm grateful to Yasha for um, suggesting that I look at Osamu's work. And I did find that Osamu indeed um, took care of the most essential case, eliminating definite fault, which then um, allowed us to see that every closed orient smooth form manifold admits a broken malicious vibration. So since then, there were many other existence results due to Gay and Kirby, Lekili, myself, Akut Kirkwood, more recently, uh, uh, Mark Hughes. But importantly, uh, most of these were either partial, so they didn't get the whole thing, or they combined several different theories, like using contact and symplectic geometry, Giro correspondence, um, switching between handle decompositions and singularity theory, and they were always implicit. They, they went through steps where you didn't see an explicit algorithm. And this was a project that um, that we initiated. So Osamu was um, very kind to invite me to Japan shortly after I obtained this result back in 2008. And we discussed how we could prove the existence of simplified broken left shift vibrations using purely um, singularity theory. And remember, the basic thing that we're after is that simplified topology. And it turned out to be much more difficult um, project than um, I initially thought. But in the meantime, um, Osamu's work and you know, influence on me grew um, bigger and bigger. 
And as it grew bigger, our um, work came to fruition only again a few years ago, essentially 10 years after we started. So we were able to show that any map from X to two sphere can be homotope to a simplified broken initial vibration. So immediate corollary is, therefore any such X admits a simplified broken Lefschetz vibration, right? Through Tom Pontragin construction, you can start with such map, approximate it with a generic map and then apply um, our work. And it's important to mention that our work gives once you start with the generic map, an explicit algorithm. So we modify that generic map step by step to obtain the simplified broken Lefschetz vibrations. And as is the case for most of these work that turn out, turn out to be more difficult than you previously thought, you know, we spent many years um, thinking about this pro problem. We were able to get a lot more out of it. So when we were looking at this, we also discovered the existence of what we call simplified trisections. So I don't have time to discuss this, but this is another approach to contemporary approach to general four manifolds, just like Hegar decompositions of three manifolds, four manifolds can be decomposed into three pieces, standard pieces. And that theory, um, again, Gay and Kirby did really use some singularity theory, but one of the things um, that we encountered was how to simplify the maps that were corresponding to these trisections, and that gave us the simplified gay, tri um, gay curve trisections that we proved to exist on all four manifolds. So this is, um, I think I'm exactly at 50 minutes. It's pretty much um, what I want to tell. But of course, most importantly, um, I want to finish um, saying happy birthday to Osamu. Um, I think his work, um, his prolific mathematics, his research, his impact as a mentor, teacher, and a professional leader is amazing. And um, I was privileged to witness this more and more. I'm almost happy that I our collaboration took 10 years. So I got to see more of it. Um, so I'm very happy to celebrate Osamu on his 60th birthday. Any questions? I'm a minute, please. Thank you for a very nice talk. I was wondering if you could say anything about the obstacles you had to overcome in your last theorem with uh, Osama, that you uh, can uh, hover top any map to a sphere to an SPRF. Um, the very last theorem with Osama, right? Um, so did I, did I hear the question right? I just want to make sure. Is the very last theorem I mentioned with Osama, how did, how did the proof go? Yeah, it was the last theorem that where you said that you could homotop a map to an SBLF. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it has multiple steps. So the first one is, you know, we start with the generic map. And then, you know, in the generic map from a four-manifold to a two-manifold, what we have is these cuts and um, faults. So one of the um, early things that we do is we get rid of the definite faults, definite case. And this is essentially going back to Osamu's work. And then we are left with indefinite faults. And of course, there are indefinite cusps we still have. So the next thing is um, these indefinite cusps. In fact, we can leave it to the end, but I, I want to mention that crucial step early on. It turns out that locally, if you have a cusp, like this kind of looks like a cusp, right? I can turn it into an indefinite fault and the left shares um, singularity. This is due to um, a lemma by Lekili. So we can get rid of the cusps towards the end and turn them into Lefschetz singularities. The most difficult part was the image because we started with a really messy image. The lot of we can we can take of course something immersed, a lot of stuff in, in, in intersections. So we want to do a few things, right? One is to make sure that we have only one fold um, curve. 
So this is, I think, going back to a trick of Levine. So you can introduce these like swallow tails and use the cusps to merge them. So you have only one um, one curve, singular curve at the end. But then still the immersed picture was very difficult for us to um, tame. And that's probably about 15, 20 pages of, um, of um, technical work, but still it was very helpful. So what, I, what we did was look at the diagram on the base and just look at how the topology of the fibers change. And we realized in some cases, we could do these kind of Rydemeister moves, like R1, R2, R3 moves. In some cases, you may or may not be able to do. So the cases we can do, we call them allowable moves. So we only looked at the base diagram and we changed the map, the topology therefore changed for the fibers through those modifications, local modifications. And um, we, we, we have maybe two, three different um, algorithms to, to, to put everything in place. Through these, what we call allowable base diagrams, we turned the immerse guy into an embedded guy and made sure that um, the fibers were all connected and such. So this is, I, I think this is, this is the summary. Thank you very much. Do you ever think of making a film of that? Making what? Film? Making a film of it. <laughs> All those steps you just went through. Um, I mean, I have it in my in, in my head. Um, Osama and I, I remember we drew a very complicated diagram on a very large um, board in the Max Planck Institute many years ago. And you know, we at first it looked very desperate, and then we were able to slowly modify it, and then found out many um, many crucial steps back then. So they have such such a movie in my head, but no, we didn't we didn't do it. It may be interesting for a presentation. Um, since we start five minutes later, I think we have time to other question. Uh, and other question? Okay. Hi Nanj, this is Osam. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. I have just a very simple question. Do you think that there is some chance to attack the four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture by using the simplified broken recessive vibrations? Because S4 admits that's kind of a vibration, right? Or that's even true. if it's not a simple one. That's true. Um, I don't, unless we can associate um, some invariance, but I think one can use it in the other direction Right, all these um, candidates have simplified broken lattice vibrations, so one can um, build them, and I know actually several people try to do it, and then show that through homotopies they give us standard things. So I think for a negative answer they may be helpful for negative answer meaning um, to show that things are standard. But to get an exotic example, which is where my heart is, um, I, I think we do need to associate better invariants, which I don't have for um, for S4 case. Because I don't have the geometric structure that, like near simplex structure and others that that I can I can use there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. This is a very interesting problem. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's uh, one one more. Okay. Uh, I think we have one minute. Just one. Yeah, maybe a very naive question from more or less an, an outsider. So uh, you mentioned this K3 example, which is an example of an uh, algebraic hypersurface, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, all the algebraic manifolds, they have the advantage that they are very, uh, yeah, very simple to state at least uh, what that manifold is mm -hmm. compared to outcomes of surgery theory where you have to keep track of a lot of manual uh, modifications, so to say. Maybe. So in your research, would it be useful to tackle more algebraic examples and get really hold on what's happening in these left sheds vibrations? And then you, you take further constructions from there, similar to how you said everything is passing through symplectic uh, mm -hmm. constructions? Mm -hmm. Would it be useful to have more algebraic examples explicitly? Um, yes, and I mean, th this is, you, you said it's coming from an outsider, but you're right on. 
So, you know, in the study of four manifolds, we look at complex algebraic surfaces a lot because, as you said, they are very rigid. We understand them better. And most of the exotic examples, the first ones, came from there. We started with something like K3 surface. So you understood most of the structure, and then you employed local things like surgeries to change it later. Even in the theory of Lecce's vibrations and pencils, the ones where we could understand the monodromy for were coming from the, again, complex world because there are some ways to read off the monodromy. With this said, um, I think they are still informing us. It would be great to understand, for example, when a positive factorization gives me a holomorphic vibration. This is an open problem. So it would be still good to understand those cases better. But in the meantime, there are many people who are just working with this like algebraic words without knowing anything about whether or not they correspond to um, complex algebraic surfaces. And you can still get a lot of mileage. So I would say, I think we are kind of past that point in some ways, but without really doing everything we should have done uh, with the algebraic surfaces, like the problem I just mentioned. Right, we use them in many constructions, but we didn't completely understand what kind of positive factorizations, for instance, come from complex ones. But um, yeah, the rigidity there is very helpful. I mean, I use it a lot um, in examples, building examples. So um, that's a very good point. Okay, thank you. Okay, let thanks us again the, the, for this very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, I think it's time to to have lunch, Mike. Hello, J just a piece of information. Uh, we return back at two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and there will be some changes in the rooms for the parallel sessions. So we can uh, we are going to inform you uh, before it happens. Okay, thank you, and have a nice lunch.